We want to thank you for joining us. Um, my name is Elizabeth Watts. I'm the planetarium manager here at um, the Pajarito Environmental Education Center. Uh, PEAK is a nonprofit organization that operates the Los Alamos Nature Center. Uh, visit our website if you want to check out some more of our programs. We have another uh, program that will be all virtual on Thursday. Uh, it was going to be here in the planetarium, but we might be getting more snow, so it will be virtual on insulation. All right. Um, you know, uh, we used to be really good at doing Zoom. Some of us have lost our touch, um, but hopefully um, you remember some basics. I think there's a Zoom housekeeping um, slide up here just to remind you of things. Um, we will be collecting uh, questions via chat for those of you who are online. Um, you can type your questions in the chat and I will relay them to our speakers at the end of the program. For those who are in the audience, um, uh, if you could speak loudly if you have a question and then we will try to repeat the questions as well for those who are online. All right, and with that, I am going to turn it over to our presenters, Grace and Anne, and thank you for coming today. All right, thank you, Elizabeth. As she said, um, we are the uh, scientists in parks interns this year, and Grace and I are working on a New Mexico meadow jumping mouse uh, project. So before we get started, this is a bit about me. So I just graduated this past May um, from Purdue University with a uh, uh, major in wildlife. Um, and so some of the things I did while I was at Purdue uh, was uh, bird banding at the Purdue Bird Banding Lab, and then also owl banding. And there are a couple of photos of me, um, one with a saw white owl, another with I think a yellow warbler, and then there's also a screech owl on there, and those are all from banding at Purdue. Um, I also had the opportunity to study abroad in Ecuador and the Galapagos. It was a short study abroad for just 10 days, um, but it was an amazing experience. So the picture of me by the waterfall is from Ecuador, and then there's a blue-footed booby and a marine iguana as well. Um, and one of my previous jobs was a small mammal tracker at the Harwood Ecosystem Experiment, which is uh, kind of a Purdue-run experiment in southern Indiana. Uh, so there's a couple of pictures of small mammal trapping as well. There's a chipmunk and a Sherman trap and a short-tailed shrew getting released. Hi, my name is Grace. Um, I'm originally from Colorado, and I also just graduated this past spring from Colorado State University up in Fort Collins, Colorado. Um, I got my degree in zoology as well as a minor in Spanish, and I also have some pictures of experiences that in college that influenced me professionally. So on the left, I have some pictures of my time studying abroad in Costa Rica, got to see a lot of really cool wildlife there. Um, I also last summer worked in Yosemite National Park doing amphibian uh, management conservation with a main focus on Yosemite toads, which um, I'm holding in the center picture. Uh, I also did a little bit of volunteering. So uh, the pika picture in the top right-ish part of this um, slide is a picture of a pika. And then I also worked as a veterinary assistant at CSU's uh, veterinary teaching hospital. So all those were really great and I feel like helped set me on the path to doing this now. All right, so this is just a bit of a review of kind of what we're going to be talking about. Um, so our main project was uh, surveying for the New Mexico meadow jumping mouse. Um, so that'll be a big bulk of our presentation. Um, but even though that was our main job, we also got to participate in a bunch of other different kinds of surveys. Um, so we helped with wildlife, trail camera monitoring, bird banding, and a bunch of other projects. Um, and we're just going to be talking about a few of the ones that we got to work on tonight. All right, so to start, as Anne mentioned, our main project this year was uh, doing surveys for the New Mexico meadow jumping mouse. And so the goal of those surveys was uh, to see if there were jumping, mi uh, jumping mice present in Bandelier or Vives Caldera. And this is of interest because 
Uh, the New Mexico Meadow Jumping Mouse is federally listed as endangered. It was enlist, or listed back in 2014. Um, it's found in riparian areas in New Mexico, southern Colorado, and Arizona. Um, in particular, they really like tall, dense vegetation near flowing water. Um, they're also only active during a few months of the year, so the warmest months. Um, and because of that, our survey season was from June to October. Um, there have been historic detections of New Mexico meadow jumping mice in the Valles Caldera, and both Valles Caldera and Bandelier have habitat. Oh, um, have habitat for jumping mice, and so we uh, were really interested in seeing kind of where they're at. Um, they're about some other information, kind of just about the mice. They are, of course, very cute, an obvious fact about them, and they're also um, seven to nine inches in, in length and the bulk of their body is actually their tail, or of that length is their tail, which is uh, really interesting. And so, let's see. Okay, yeah. Um. We bought a new cable. <laughs> Maybe it mentioned to the people online. Oh. We are having some technical difficulties with having slideshows show up on our big screen. To hold it in place. Okay. Actually, I have an idea. Okay. I have an idea. Okay. Awesome. Thank y'all for your patience. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're back in business. So for surveying these um, this mouse species, uh, we use track plates, and we were able to do that because they have very distinctive feet. Um, they have very long toes compared to other common small mammals found in the area. So here in the photos, you can see some examples of what their tracks look like compared to voles and deer mice, which are other uh, common small mammals that we would get on our track plates. Um, there is also, so with the track plating, it's less invasive than live trapping them. And there have been studies done that have shown that the track plating and live trapping uh, come up with uh, very similar uh, detection probabilities, and so it, just in seeing whether or not they're present. So with this, we're not able to tell how many are there, but we can tell if they're there or not. And just to give a little bit more detail on what that survey, the track plating survey kind of process looked like. So 
Um, in the bottom right, we have a picture of one of our chalk plates. And so what we would do for all of our surveys is we would build these chalk plates and set them out along streams uh, in Vias Caldera or Bandelier. And so we'd have, ooh, maybe I'll use this fun laser. So we would start with the lid and then you can't see it on here, but there's a piece of contact paper um, and that, um, and then each of the boxes would have holes cut out on both sides and that would be the entrance. And then we'd put oats, which was our bait, on the opposite side of the hole. So the mice would, you know, go into the entrance, see that there's this lovely food incentive for them. They run across to the, across the middle where we have our ink pad. And then they would have the ink on their, um, on their paws, their feet, and they can uh, then eat the oats and then leave. So as Anne was saying, it's uh, not invasive. So the mice aren't hurt at all. And uh, we're able to see what's hanging around these stream areas. And so we'd put the lid on top and then a piece of tar paper on top of that as a bit of rain protection because we were doing this dur during the monsoon season. And so we do plates of, or surveys with 80 to 200 plates, just depending on um, where we were at. And we would set the plates out and then check them for uh, three days. So uh, three night, four day survey. And then at the end, we would collect all the plates. And during those days, if we found tracks on uh, the contact paper, then we would uh, collect those sheets, uh, put them on paper, put them in a binder, and then we would review them for jumping mice tracks. And if we found any suspicious tracks that looked like jumping mice, we would send them off to experts who would then uh, give us confirmation on whether they were jumping mice or not. And so, so along with our track surveys, we also did habitat surveys. Um, and this just allows us to compare areas that do and do not have mice, maybe see what they're preferring. Um, so to do our vegetation surveys, we recorded vegetation type, which we separated into different categories, which were grasses, sedges, reeds, forbs, woody, which is just like trees, and uh, coneflowers. We were particularly interested in coneflowers uh, because jumping mice seem to be associated with coneflowers. Um, they could be a food source or perhaps they just exist in areas that jumping mice like. Um, along with that, we also recorded the density of the vegetation uh, within 15 feet of the water. Um, so it's just how much is covered by vegetation versus bare ground. We also did soil moisture, and that was just on a scale of one th to three um, as to how moist the soil was next to the stream, um, as well as plant height. As Grace mentioned earlier, they like taller uh, vegetation, uh, so we made note on average of how tall the vegetation was along the streams that we were sampling. And then finally, we noted the presence or absence of upland habitat. Um, so these were just areas uh, near the stream that were, they're drier, they're more on slopes. And the mice use these areas for hibernation uh, during the winter. All right, so what did we find out from our surveys? We did a total of nine surveys. Um, seven of which were in the Vias Caldera and two of which were in the Bandelier, or were in Bandelier. And we have a map that shows uh, the locations, the stars are where we did our surveys at. And it was very exciting because we had jumping mice confirmed in one location in the Vias Caldera. Um, we got tracks on, I believe, two days in a row. And we so we sent those off to um, the experts at Northern Arizona University, and they did confirm that they were jumping mouse. They also thought, based off of our plates, that there was likely more than one uh, jumping mouse, so a population there, which is really great. Um, that same location had jumping mice uh, detected in 2018, so also really good to see that that population uh, is still there. Um, additionally, we went to, so this is the, or there, this, the jumping mice surveys were done last year as well, and they had some potential tracks at a few locations. So this year we resurveyed a few of those places, and we did not find, um, we did not get more potential tracks. So um, 
that was kind of a good thing to see from the previous year of uh, getting more confirmation on if those tracks were anything. So future surveys may be needed, but we didn't pick those up. Oh, and then also we have some examples of what those uh, track sheets looked like. We have the jumping mice track circled. On these sheets, we don't have any other uh, species besides the jumping mice, um, but this is kind of what that data looks like. And looking to the future, the uh, jumping mice surveys will continue to go on as uh, future interns and crews will uh, check out other locations and resurvey resurvey places as well. All right, so that was our jumping mouse project. So now Grace and I are going to talk a little bit about some of the other things that we did here at Bandelier. And the first one up is the wildlife trail cameras. Um, so throughout the season, Grace and I would go out and check trail cameras that were placed around the park. Um, and these cameras help tell us what species are present uh, and what they're doing. And on the slide, there's listed some common species that we see on the cameras. Um, so these cameras help us see things that we wouldn't normally just walking through the park or doing other surveys. Um, for example, we were able to catch a hog nose skunk on the cameras, which confirmed that they were in the park, which we didn't know before. Um, we also put our cameras on lion gills, and that just allows us to see how many lions are coming back, and then also what scavengers are also using these kills as a food source. And then here we just have some fun photos from our trail cameras. Um, so there is a, a black bear, there's a striped skunk, there's a group of turkeys, um, there's a nice bull elk, there's also a mountain lion, uh, a bobcat, and a coyote. Uh, and these are just from all different areas around the park. Uh, in addition to kind of broadly uh, checking out what wildlife are, uh, are in the park and what they're doing, we also have cameras specifically geared uh, towards monitoring beavers in the park. And so 28 beavers have been reintroduced to Friolis Canyon uh, with a through partnership with the New Mexico Department of Game and Fish uh, between 2019 and 2023. And so uh, we use the, uh, because of those reintroductions, uh, cameras have been put up where uh, those beavers have put up dams and lodges in the park. And that's been a way to see how the beavers are uh, using those areas and also how other wildlife species are using the, the beaver ponds. and. Um, it's it's fun to watch them build their uh, their dams. We say the phrase "busy as a beaver." I have learned is absolutely true because they are always doing stuff, um, and it was really exciting because this year uh, from those trail cameras we uh, were able to see that at least three kits have been born to two different families. So it's great to know that those um, beavers are doing really well and that they're able to keep growing that population. Um, and beavers are really important to Freeholies Canyon because they are ecosystem engineers, which um, what that looks like is when they build their dams, they help trap water in, uh, in an area which is really great for vegetation growth, um, especially larger plants that might need more water. Um, and Freeholies and Bandelier has uh, had a lot of experience with fire and flooding and so helping to kind of um, regrow that area. The beavers have played a really important part in that. Um, I think some something else that's been really interesting is the cameras this year have really helped to see how resilient beavers are. So kind of two examples of that are earlier this summer our beaver ponds dried up and which was really interesting and you know we weren't really sure where the beavers go, how do they respond to just the water going away and we were able to see that they were still there and once the water came back they just went about their business as usual. Um, additionally, Bandelier experienced a flash flood sometime in I think it was September, I, September I believe, um, which went through that area where the beavers live and it did take out a few of their dams but they got right back to work and started rebuilding and are doing their thing so that's always really exciting to see. Um, yeah. And here we have a video of 
Uh, this is a baby beaver. Super fun. And then we have another video of, of an adult with a baby with a kit. And both of them are doing their part with their sticks in their mouths. All right, so the next project that we're gonna talk about is bird banding at Vandelier. Um, so when Grace and I first got here, uh, we got to help out with hummingbird banding. And so that was from uh, May to July. Um, and the hummingbird banding station helps us uh, monitor production and migration, just like some other uh, regular bird banding stations do. Um, at the station, we captured three species out of the four that we possibly could catch, and that was the, those were the broad-tailed hummingbird, the rufous hummingbird, and the black chin hummingbird. Unfortunately, this year, we did not catch a, any calliope's hummingbirds. Um, there are species that just migrates through here, like the rufous does, um, but we didn't happen to catch any this time. Um, on the screen, there is, a uh, this is the kind of traps that we use to catch them. Um, so there's a feeder hanging in the center. Um, and then there's a essentially like a hoop net that's set up around it and the sides raised with a string that we pull. Um, and so when hummingbirds land on the feeder, we release that string and the net falls down um, so that the hummingbirds are stuck inside. And then we just walk up to the trap and just very carefully get them out. Um, another thing about hummingbird banding is hummingbirds require very special bands. So we ourselves do not band them. Um, a master hummingbird bander named Bob banded them for us. Um, they require little teeny tiny bands because they're so small. So each band needs to be cut out of a metal sheet and then shaped into the correct shape. Uh, but we did get to help uh, weigh them and we also fed them and released them. Another thing about this site is it's a high fidelity site, which is interesting just because a lot of bird banding stations have very low recapture rates. So the recapture rates here are a bit higher than usual. And here we just have some fun photos of the hummingbirds we caught. So um, starting from the left, there's a broad-tailed hummingbird and then a rufous hummingbird. And then there's a female black chin hummingbird and she has some nice yellow pollen on her chin. And then there is a male black chin hummingbird. All right, in the fall, we did songbird banding. So that ran from August to October. We uh, helped band 905 new birds. Uh, there was also another intern named Thea, and she was the lead bird banding intern. So uh, she was also a part of that with us. We, in total, banded 42 species, and the data we collected uh, we followed MAPS protocol, um, which is the Monitoring Avian Production Survivorship. Um, so some of that data included age, sex, body measurements, which is wing length, tail length, and mass. We also uh, noted breeding characteristics, as well as uh, flight, feather, and body molt. Um, uh, banding at Bandelier has been going on for over 20 years for fall migration, so it's interesting to kind of see how those patterns change. Um, this year, the most common bird, the bird that was banded the, that we got the most for banding was the pine siskin, and then the top five were the pine siskin followed by chipping sparrow, dusky flycatcher, western bluebird, and then the gray-headed junco. So those were some little fun facts about what we got this year. And then if you go to the next page, we've got pictures of some of those birds. So going from top left to right, we've got a pygmy nuthatch, a Wilson's warbler, a northern flicker, a mountain chickadee, and then in the bottom row, uh, we've got an Audubon's warbler, a, a ruby crown kinglet, a vesper sparrow, and then a green-tailed towhee. So lots of variety um, of species, which is awesome. All right, and then real quick, we're gonna talk about just some of the other projects that we worked on while we were here. 
Um, so one of the things that we were able to do, which was really uh, fun, was help collar a mountain lion. Uh, there's a project running here in Mandalier with collared mountain lions. Um, and so in the bottom right, there's a picture of the mountain lion we helped capture. Um, it was a sub-adult female uh, marked as F60. Um, I just lost my train of thought. But um, yeah, a sub-adult female marked as F60. So we got to help take body measurements on her as well as set up um, the trap that caught her. Uh, along with that, we also did surveying for the critically endangered Hamas Mountain Salamander. Um, it's a small salamander that's uh, endemic to the Hamas Mountains. Um, unfortunately, during our surveys, when we were doing them, we didn't find any. Um, but there were some found this year, I think maybe around seven. I'm not entirely sure on the number, but it's still a very small number. Um, yeah. Another thing that we got to help out with was electrofishing, and so with this, we worked with the wildlife crew at Virus Caldera and helped them with their electrofishing efforts. So we went uh, to streams on in the Virus Caldera as well as on Forest Service land, and we got information. Oh, for reference, the a picture of electrofishing is in the top right. And so what we did was we got information on what species were in those streams as well as uh, fish length and weight. And so the species we found were Rio Grande sucker and chub as well as rainbow trout and uh, brown trout. And uh, additionally, we got to uh, help out with a variety of other projects here and there, which was really interesting and get to um, assist uh, other researchers and kind of partners of the park. And so, for example, there's a day we went out with US, uh, USGS and did uh, soil biocrust surveys. We did, we worked with the Southern Colorado Plateau Monitoring Inventory Network for or macro invertebrate surveys uh, for a couple days. Um, additionally, we got to help out with a couple other just general natural resources projects of Bandelier. So, for example, air, uh, air quality and water quality. So, Definitely got to see a lot of different um, projects going on and sort of what all is included with uh, natural resources for the park service. Oh, and then I did, lastly, we did get to do some outreach. So um, we were here at Peak for Bear Fest, which was really fun. Um, we had a table for Public Lands Day at Bandelier as well as Fall Fiesta and got to educate the public and uh, children about what natural resources looks like at Bandelier. And so we have some more photos of some of the things that we got to do. Um, yeah. Yeah, so this first photo is Grace and I uh, measuring uh, the mountain lion that we helped catch her. Um, and then <laughs> this was during uh, one of our uh, the jumping mouse surveys, uh, we found a garter snake and it was just minding its own business so we took a photo with it <laughs> um one of my uh i think it was my first week here um at, we had a work day at our sankui unit um hiking up the signs which it looks heavy it, it's not actually heavy it was just uh acted like a wind sail <laughs> um and this photo here is a Hamas mountain salamander um it was, this one was found by our coworker, Thea, who was our uh, lead bird intern this year. Um, and then this is Grace measuring uh, one of the fish that we caught during electrofishing. Um, oh, and then this is us at our outreach table at the National Public Lands Day. Um, we had a table on using your senses in nature, and so, they are trying to find hidden animals in the photos. All right, so that's that's all we have today. So we just want to say thank you uh, to everyone for listening and just kind of uh, concluding. Uh, Anna and I talked about what we got most out of our internship this year and what sort of things that we can take away for the future. So we both agreed that we learned a lot of new skills, so learning 
um, how to use various pieces of field equipment and how to do different surveys and just kind of general knowledge about this area and the wildlife, uh, which was all really exciting and interesting. Um, we also got to work with a lot of different people, both within Bandelier, but also with um, other organizations and got to learn about them and their experiences and sort of what that collaborative effort looks like uh, in the park service. Yeah, as Grace said, it was great to get a bunch of new experience. Um, it was really interesting to explore different parts of the field and our interests and a really great way for us to start off our natural resources careers. Um, and finally, we leave you with a chunky bear having the time of his life rolling in the mud. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Well, thank you both for your presentation. Does anyone here in the planetarium have any questions? Sure. Right. Mm -hmm. So there's one place in the caldera mm -hmm. that you find. Can you show where you found it? Um, okay, the question was uh, where in the caldera we had our jumping mouse detection. Um, unfortunately, we cannot share that because they, because they're a listed species, that location cannot be shared, but uh, it is, it was in the caldera and it wasn't a spot that had previously, oh, I think I already said that, had previously had detections. Um, yeah, so it's in a stream in the caldera. Oh, yes. So we were asked to explain a bit more about electrofishing. Um, is there anything in particular or just in general how it works? Yeah. So electrofishing kind of is what it sounds like. Um, if I can get to the photo. Um, I think it's a little hard to see in this photo, um, but we have, there is, there, there. Uh, this person with the backpack uh, has the uh, electroshocker on their back, and then there's a long uh, pole that they're holding with a hoop on the ends, and then there's a tail that also trails behind them in the water, and it sends out an electrical current. Um, and so when that happens, it stuns all the fish that are around them. And so they just kind of stop moving and kind of float for a minute. And then we quickly scoop them up with the nets and see there's a bunch of people walking around with nets. Um, and Grace here has the bucket. And so after they're scooped up out of the water, we just quickly put them in the bucket, which has an aerator to keep oxygen flowing. Um, and then they're, they just kind of recover in the bucket. Um, and then afterwards, we'll take the bucket up onto shore um, and measure each fish. So we just kind of quickly take them out of the bucket. There's a, um, um, yeah, you can kind of see it here. This is the, um, the way that we measure them. Uh, there's like a ruler down inside of it um, and it's curved so we can put a little bit of water in there with them. Um, and we measure them from their snout to the end of their tail. And then we quickly weigh them um, on a scale and then they're put back in the water. Any other questions? Yes. Oh, and you said that's uh, the salamander, mm -hmm. the endangered salamander. So is that a typical size? I had no idea they were that tiny. The question was, is the photo that we have of a salamander, um, is that how big they are? Yes, my understanding is that they are pretty small. I had not, I've not seen very mass, many salamanders in my life. So when I learned of their size, I was also surprised because I would think of them as being bigger. But yeah, they're pretty small. Um, the other species of salamander around here is the tiger salamander, and they're much bigger than the Hamas Mountain salamander.
And so I yeah. Yes. Oh. <laughs> the question was, what are we doing next? Um, this uh, winter, I'll be a ski instructor in Colorado. And then the hope is to continue doing wildlife stuff during the summer field season. Um, I don't know yet where I'm going to be going next. Um, I've applied to a variety of different jobs that kind of start um, after the first of the year. Uh, but, yeah. What was your favorite thing Um, and the question was, what was our favorite thing that we did this summer? Um, for me, I really enjoyed the bird banding. Uh, I've done a lot of bird stuff in the past, so it, I'm from Indiana. So going from eastern birds to western birds was really cool to see. Um, that's really tough because I loved a lot of the things that we did. I'd say, uh, even though we only got to do it once, I love the mountain lion collaring just because I have an interest in large mammal work. So getting to dip my toe in the water with that was really awesome. But I'd probably say bird banding as well was really great because I had not done that before. And so that was, um, really exciting to learn how to do that and learn more about birds. All right, um, and we just had one comment from online. Uh, they said, great job. Um, so. Um, Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So um, if we don't have any further questions, I want to thank everyone for joining us here, both online and in person. And I want to thank our um, our two interns um, for, for a great talk. And I'm glad you had fun. And um, we look forward to hearing more in the future. All right. And thank you all. Everyone have a good night. Watch out. It's going to snow again. So we're told. So <laughs> everyone stay warm. Thank you for coming. Bye.